you and your spouse are about to celebrate your 50th wedding anniversary and the kids are going to throw a party and invite extended family and friends and of course they're expecting you to make some sort of speech uh, uh, how, uh, how s- such a thing is possible, 50 years is possible in our modern day culture today and so, so you begin to prepare your speech uh, looking back over the last 50 years but what do you say? Uh, what do you tell others about 50 years of marriage? Or you're about to retire from a job that you've worked the last 40 years and your kids are grown and gone, the house is quiet, and you're about to embark on your retirement years, and you're looking forward to the days ahead, but right now you're not focusing on the adventure ahead as much as you are this moment of remembering and reflecting on the one that you're wrapping up. And so you're preparing the speech for your retirement bank. What do you say? I mean, For a few moments, people might listen to the wisdom that you've gleaned over the years, so what do you tell them? Those situations are kind of of the situation in which King Solomon finds himself. Uh, Now in his latter years, he presses pause in an effort to kind of recap his life and share some guidance and wisdom to all those who are going to come behind him. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verse 1 says this, it says, So I reflected on all this and concluded that the righteous and the wise and what they do are in God's hands. In other words, Solomon says, I'm reflecting on all that I've learned, and here's what I've learned, okay? Now, keep in mind, this is the wisest of all men saying, here's how you should live life, and uh, here's some lessons from my experiences, and he begins to reflect on some pivotal times in his life. And I think if we're wise, we listen to him, right? Uh, you know, so, so, well, church family, this is week number three in a series of messages uh, from the book of Ecclesiastes, if, if you're new here this morning. And we're entitling this particular sermon, well, the series is entitled A Time for Everything, but this particular sermon is A Time to Reflect. Now, in the previous two weeks, Solomon's been sharing all his life experiences. That he's tried everything out, and, and he's shared with us that much of what he's found under the sun, meaning without God, is meaningless, okay? It's a chasing after the wind. But now he's coming to the end, and he's going to take time to reflect and, and give some serious insight uh, for instance, I, you know, it, it, I think it's worth listening to because this week uh, I kind of got curious about people's last words. This is kind of like Solomon's last will, you know, his last testament, so to speak. He's uh, taking an opportunity to journal this to us. And I thought, has anybody else done this? And so I did some research about last words uttered by people that we might know on their deathbed. And some are funny, and some are kind of sad, and others are philosophical, and some are extremely, you know, memorable. But here's, here, here's a few. Case in point. I understand that the final words of the great American poet Emily Dickinson's were, I must go in, the fog is rising. Kind of poetic and fits her. The last words of Thomas Edison, pretty smart guy, said, it's very beautiful over there. The final words of Steve Jobs was, oh, wow, oh, wow, oh, wow. Karl Marx's parting words were, go on, get out. Last words are for fools who have not yet said enough. He's kind of in a mood, I guess. Bob Marley's last words were, money can't buy life. And lastly, Oscar Wilde's last words as he departed this world were, either the wallpaper goes or I do. I guess he'd been looking at it a while, and I'm taking it, he went. Anyway, you ever wonder what your last words might be? I used to fear that my last words would be something like, hey, Bubba, watch this. You know, be something like that. Or, Margie, look, no hands, you know, no hands. Uh, Unfortunately, after a lifetime, or fortunately for Solomon, after a lifetime of some of the most bizarre and incredible decisions in life experience, Solomon chose his words much more carefully. And after his search for happiness ended, he then reflects on the seasons of life that he has had. And he gives us some last words that contain four life lessons. And uh, for all you note takers, here's the first one. The first one is, this is your one and only life, so enjoy it. Okay, this is your one and only life, so enjoy it. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, we're going to be in that book throughout this morning, so if you haven't turned there, please do. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verses 7 and 8 tells us this. It says, go eat your food with gladness and drink your wine with a joyful heart. For now is that God, for it is now that God favors what you do. Always be clothed in white and always anoint your head with oil. Now that first part we get, the second part might be a little strange, it's kind of a cultural thing, but anyway... What he's saying here is your time on earth, whether it be long or whether it be short, it should be something that you enjoy. 
It should be something, regardless of your circumstances, because while we can't control, control our circumstances, we can re- control how we respond to them, and so it is possible to have joy in our life if, if we remember what Solomon has taught us in the previous week's lesson, which is what we learned last week was is that only with God can you find true happiness. Okay, So enjoy life, but don't, don't forget where that's found. It's found in God. So, so what Solomon's making reference to when he says, this, this strange part to us, always be clothed in white and always anoint your head with oil. He's making reference to, in their culture, what we would call creature comforts. You know creature comforts? Uh, our creature comforts are probably more advanced than theirs were then. Uh, like, but for around here, in the wintertime, in the evening, sitting in your family room, some, you know, some of your creature comforts might be like if you got a fireplace, turning the fireplace on and sitting in the warmth of the fireplace with a, a cup of hot chocolate while you watch TV or read a good book. But the reason why they could be glad and joyful was the fact that they wore white garments and anointed themselves with oil. And we're going like, what's up with that? Well, the white garments reflected heat instead of absorbing it, and the anointing of oil protected their skin from the harsh climate, okay? Verse 9 then goes on to say, enjoy life with your wife. I, I love this verse. It's, it's so positive and negative and all the same. Catch this. Verse 9, he says, enjoy life with your wife whom you love. Good start, right? <laughs> All the days of this meaningless life that God has given you under the sun, all your meaningless days. For this is your lot in life and in your toilsome labor under the sun. So there's a sense in which the present life is meaningless. We've covered that the last two weeks compared to the next one, which is going to be eternal in the presence of the Lord. But we should note that while we wait for that eternal to come in its fullness, we need to understand that even in the here and now, in this life, we can only find true happiness in God, and we should, okay? The Bible teaches in 1 Peter 2 that as Christians, we are like strangers and aliens in this present world. But while we're here, living in this fallen and broken world, we must make the most of it because on this present earth, this is your one and only life. But then again, because we know that life for the Christian is eternal, that we never truly die. I mean, I believe that knowledge that, that life in Christ is eternal, which means we're free from the fear of sin and death. I mean, if you're free of that, Christians should be having more fun than anyone on planet Earth, right? Because you can't kill this, right? You just can't kill this. I mean, why, why is that? Well, someone said a long time ago, as a Christian, your past is forgiven and your future is settled right? Your past is forgiven and your future settled so you can have joy. Listen, church family, it's, if that's truly the case that your past is forgiven and your future is settled and it is, then you should be having more fun and joy than anyone else, right? You should, okay? Now, does that mean as Christians we never have troubles? No. In John 16, Jesus told his fathers, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace, Okay, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. So Jesus says, in the world you will have troubles. It's not if, it's when. But sometimes with wrong thinking, we allow those troubled circumstances as Christians to rob us of our joy. And as a result, we don't look joyful, you know, we don't look like joyful Christians whose future is settled. Okay, instead we look more like those frustrated cabbage patch kids. You remember those from years ago? They always had those like puckered up lips, you know, and uh, sour looks on their face, which kind of reminds me of those Christian pin on buttons that used to be around. You know what I'm talking about? You pin them on your coat. Uh, There used to be one that said, if you have joy, joy, joy down in your heart, what's the next part of that song? Yeah, you should show it, right? Well, this one said, if you have joy, joy, joy in there, you might want to notify your face. Because that's how, it's, you know, some people look like those Cabbage Patch dolls. But it's, it's, you know, but it also tells you how it's supposed to work. Joy is something that comes from within. It's supposed to, right? And it's not based on outward circumstance. It comes from what's within. 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18 puts the eternal versus the temporary in proper perspective for the Christ follower. It says this. It says, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. What's the all? Our temporary and momentary troubles. Eternal far outweighs it, right? And uh, so, so as a result, we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal, okay? And in John 10.10, 10, we read where Jesus said, I have come that you may have life and that you may have it to the full. Does that sound like a good thing? 
It is a good thing, okay? So life is short. Make sure you're enjoying it. Now, back in Ecclesiastes 5, verse 19, Solomon says, Moreover, when God gives any man wealth and possessions and enables him to enjoy them, to accept his lot and be happy in his work, this is a gift of God. He's saying it's okay to enjoy it. Understand where it comes from, though. It's a gift from God. So while the last two weeks we've kind of heard Solomon proclaim from the mountaintops that nothing under the sun will bring complete satisfaction in life, that it's all meaningless, it's all a chasing after the wind, now here in chapter 5 he says there can be joy in the things that God gives man, including his work. For joy will accompany him in his work, he says. So having a job should add to your joy, not, not subtract from it, right? And work, work's beneficial. It gives us a sense of satisfaction, dignity, self-worth. And work gives us a place to develop relationships and influence people for Christ. So it's good. It's good. And I, and I, hope, I hope to do a series of messages later this year. I've kind of got it written down. I want to do it. Uh, uh, there was a book written years ago. I Bill Hybels, I think, wrote Christians in the Marketplace, but I want to do something like that uh, where we talk about what work is and, and, and how it's beneficial. But ask anyone who's been unemployed for a while, they'll probably tell you that work is a blessing, not a curse, okay? It's a good thing. Now, here's the second lesson. Life is short, so give it your all. Life is short, for give it all. Ecclesiastes 9.10. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might, for in the grave where you are going, there is neither working nor planning nor knowledge nor wisdom. I love the way he writes this. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, give it all you got because you're soon going to the grave, okay? Uh, take note. Okay, the, the building progression, though, of the passage. In verse 7, it's all about contentment. Verse 8, it's about comfort. Now, verse 9, it's about companionship. You see, those things allow an individual to kind of dive into a task. As Solomon points out here in verse 10, he says, do it with all your might and give it your all. Solomon uses this comparison to stress how you must make the most of every opportunity. In other words, if you have a chance to do something, do it now, okay? Because who knows what tomorrow will bring. Commentators refer to this particular passage as the Carpe Diem passage, which of course means, what's it mean? Seize the day, yeah. So seize the day, Solomon says. Be passionate about the task at hand. Let your light shine wherever you are, whatever you're doing. Years ago, I, I read this story by a preacher with uh, uh, years of experience, and he, and he tells a story like this. He says, one day I was called to the hospital to visit a woman whose husband was dying. Uh, the man was in ICU, and I visited with them, and we went out to the waiting room, and a few minutes later, the doctor came out and gave us the news that this woman did not want to hear, and that was that her husband had just passed away. And then he says he waited a little while and then came, came in, uh, and they got us and we went into the room where the dead body of the woman's husband lay. And he said there was a nurse in the room who was washing this man's face, preparing the undertakers for the undertakers to come and take the body. And as she washed the face, the, the minister said she was doing it as though it were her own father, so tender. A chaplain then came, he said, ushered us into another room, and this nurse went with us, and his words were comforting and and helpful and then he prayed and then he finished praying and he said I looked up and I saw this nurse sitting in the corner and the tears were just streaming down her face he said I walked down the stairs with this new widow and walked her out to her car and then I went back into the ICU unit and sought out that nurse just to say thank you he said ma'am I just want to say thank you and I don't know how you do it you see people die almost every day and I don't know how you have that kind of compassion day after day how do you do it and she simply replied well, I'm a Christian. And then she went about her work. Solomon says, life is short. Give it your all. I mean, what if you began to see your workplace as a mission field? That wherever you go and whatever you do, your mission is to advance the kingdom of God. What, what, what can you do that's, you, you can also do that kind of thing by serving the church, yeah, but you can do it by volunteering in the community or just help out around the house. The point is, I think that Solomon's trying to make, to make sure that we use our time and energy in just such a way that God is honored by our effort, wherever that may be. You know, there's a word, I, I, if, if you, you know, I've been, I read every day the electronic news, you know, and there's a word in the news about every day now, and the word is that a recession's coming with layoffs on the horizon, you know, and that comes on the back of statistics that re reveal that during COVID and post-COVID that many baby boomers are hanging up their work clothes and, and joining the ranks of the retired. And the word for those folks, either way, that, that opens, that, you know, I think is, it opens up a great opportunity. If it turns 
out that you're one of those that lose your job, well, then that may open the door to even greater possibilities, you know, for you to utilize your gift. Or if you're retiring, what a great opportunity to form a new partnership with God. Sometimes new retirees, uh, when they retire, especially from a long-term job, you know, one they've had maybe years and years and years, they, they retire, then they turn around and get a new job, okay? Uh, maybe one with more freedom, but they get a new job. And, and you know, and, and maybe it's not as good as the job they have, but it's a new job, and it has a new opportunity. And, and I had to ask myself, yeah, does God really care? Well, I believe he cares. You know, I, I don't think it matters whether you're stocking shelves or selling stocks. I think he cares, but what he cares about, you know, here's why he cares. Because work that partners with God is always a blessing. If you understand what it is that you're doing, is for the Lord, there's a blessing in there. Whether it's stocking shelves or selling stocks, I don't think it matters. But God cares. Or better yet, in your retirement, rather than pick up a new job, what if you seek to help out somewhere in a volunteer position? Maybe at a hospital, answering phones in the waiting room. They always need those people, you know. Or maybe to help out some nonprofit charity. The point is that whatever you do, you recognize that you can find joy in it because it's a gift from God. Remember Solomon's words in Ecclesiastes 3.13. He said, that everyone may, that everyone may find satisfaction in all his toil. This is the gift of God. It's out there for you if you want it. How many, how many parents do we have here? Show of hands this morning. How, it doesn't matter how old your child is or, you know, how old you are. How many, a lot of parents out there. Okay, I have a question for you. How many of you have ever said to one of your children, I just want you to try your best? Okay, the rest of them you said, try for something lesser. Uh, no, you wouldn't do that. Sorry. Uh, I just want you to try my best. Most of us have said that, whether it be uh, for your child's school studies or whether it be their effort in some sport or activity or to your adult child in the workplace, right? I mean, we still parent our adult children when they'll let us, uh, you know, but we've said, I just want you to try your best, right? And most of us have done that. A lot of parents tell their kids that, but here's the deal. Different parents mean that in different ways, don't they? They do, okay? For instance, some parents mean just give your best because I expect you to be the best. And if you're not the best, then you didn't try your best, right? We've all seen that, okay? And that's not the way it ought to go. But here's, here's how it should really go. Now, I'm going to date some of you in here, so, but please play along. How many of you recognize the name Kathy Rigby? It's an old, old name. Kathy Rigby. Yeah, okay, I didn't know this one thing about her, but anyway, yeah, you dated yourself. Uh, Kathy Rigby was the Olympic gymnast champion in 1968, <laughs> okay, uh, national champion in 1970, 72, but here's, here's what I didn't know. She played the part of Peter Pan for 30 years, and uh, 30 years she did. Anyway, in 1972 Olympics, now get it, she won the national championship in 1972, and then in the 72 Olympics, most Americans were convinced that Kathy Rigby would win a gold medal in the in the gymnastics, but she, and she competed, but she didn't win the gold. In fact, she didn't win any medal at all. Afterwards, dejected, she went up into the bleachers and began to cry, and she told her parents, I'm so sorry, but I did the best I could. And her dad said, I know that, your mother knows that, and God knows that. But then her father said 10 words that Kathy said she's never forgotten. He said, doing your best is more important than being the best. And he's right. Solomon said, whatever you do, do it with all your might. Likewise, the Apostle Paul said in Colossians 3, 23 and 24, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as though you're working for the Lord, not for men, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ that you are serving. Third lesson, the race is long, so keep running. Okay, the race is long, so keep ready. You've heard me say before that Christian life is not a sprint. It's like a marathon, and the reason I say that is because the Bible says that, right? In other words, it's a long race, and it, we have to be in it for the long haul. I think it was Eugene Peterson who once wrote a book entitled A Long Obedience in the Same Direction, and as I recall, it was a reminder to Christians, the whole book, that when you accepted Jesus Christ as the Lord of your life, you were committing to faithfully following him forever all the way through eternity and if you know eternity it never ends so forever right someone once said life is 10 percent what happens to you and 90 percent how you respond that's true and it, but what it means is you'll face the obstacles but the difference maker is how you handle them how you approach those obstacles ecclesiastes 9 11 reminds us it says i have seen solomon says i've seen 
seen something else under the sun. The race is not to the swift or the battle to the strong, nor does food come to the wise or wealth to the brilliant or favor to the learned, but time and chance happen to them all. Now, Solomon's point is, well, he's pointing out that two factors can upset all human calculations. I mean, he looks at life, and his conclusion is that time and chance determine who prospers and who doesn't. And it's not necessarily those who are more able or those who are more gifted or those that are stronger that reap the benefits of life. Now, that's not probably how most of us think, right? That's certainly not what our culture teaches us, okay? I mean, we would expect the fastest person to win the foot race, the most seasoned and powerful warrior to win the battle, and the most mentally competent would have the best parts of life as well. But Solomon's point is that's not always the case, not always. One scholar who gave commentary on this passage writes, time is a factor in the outcomes of life, and we, we don't know how much we have. That's why we must seize the day. And chance is the other factor, because those unexpected events that happen can change the playing field. Therefore, regardless of the best planning and effort, strange things can happen. And when that happens, we maybe call it the perfect storm, or we call it a fluke chance, but it happens. It happens. It's the unknown Cinderella team that wins the March Madness tournament, right? And we all hope for that, right? Because it says something to us. The singer eliminated from American Idol comes back in the wild card and wins the whole thing. Or years ago, you might know this, when a grocery store stock boy named Kurt Warner, stocking groceries, five years later becomes Super Bowl MVP quarterback. I mean, it's like the old adage I heard every Saturday on TV show growing up, the wide world of sports. Every week, you'd hear that famous saying, you can experience the joy of victory or the what? Agony of defeat. For instance, one might experience agony of defeat. A disturbing diagnosis changes everything, okay? It's a chance, but it changes. A heartache of a pink slip, the loss of a loved one. In other words, you have some mountaintops in life, but you're also going to have some valleys, but Solomon points out that this journey called life isn't a sprint. It's a marathon. And time and chance are something that play a part in it for everyone. And that's why we must seize the day, seize each day. Now, that doesn't mean that we're looking for spectacular display of faith, like when Elijah defeated the 350 prophets of Baal, or when Moses parted the Red Sea, or when Peter preached his first sermon and several thousand people. How'd you like to be that first, first sermon and 3,000 people, right? <laughs> Peter did, okay? Now, that's, that's not something that happens every day, okay? Uh, but it's still something that happens today on occasion, okay? Because it still does from time to time. I mean, I mean, we just heard it was all over the news about a revival in what college? Asbury College, yeah. I mean, we see people of faith taking a stand for Christ in our culture who seek to, I mean, our culture seeks to crucify these people because like they did Christ. They want him to go away, you know. But these people, they, they stand strong. They come out with a victory. I mean, it might happen that way for you, but typically that's not the way it works. See, God's expecting you and God's counting on me 24-7 every day that we, ha that we have in this life to try to somehow be an ambassador for him. That's what he wants, okay, to remind people of why we're here and our purpose in life, what it is, and our purpose is to bring glory to God, okay? It's to live in such a way that will light, we'll shine a light on Jesus Christ. It's to run the race that we call the Christian life all the way faithfully to eternity and to take as many people with us as we can. You know, even in the Bible where we read about the heroes of the faith, it wasn't one spectacular event after another that God was asking of his people, was it? He didn't, like, he wasn't asking all his people, like, I, I want another big one today. No, what he was asking for was a daily life of faithfulness. That's what he was looking for, just daily faithfulness. And so it is with the Christ follower today. We are to be a light in dark places. We are to be the salt that brings flavor to the world. But sometimes many Christians think it's going to be one spectacular event after another, one mountaintop experience after the next. But, but instead, what it is, it's like a marathon where you grind it out, Okay. It's not that nothing big ever happens, but on a daily basis, you grind it out. You grind it out. It's the daily grind over time. That's why Jesus says in Matthew 16, 24, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily, daily, and follow me. And that's why in Galatians 2, 20, we read, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. It's a daily yielding of our life. Let me just say this. There are so many, uh, so many examples of this. You know, 
one of the privileges of, of being a senior minister in church is you, you get to see things that maybe other people don't get to see. And so when, when I read this, I, I don't want us to think that we're not faithful. I see a lot of faithfulness here. I think as so many of you um, by name, but I'm not going to name you because there's too many, but so many of you that are past what some would think as retirement age, you know, that are still serving Christ and serving others in this church, teaching our children, okay, serving funeral meals and some doing, you know, behind the scenes stuff that no one knows you're doing. It's being done. And I think of the sacrifice that many of you are making for the building project. And there's no age limit on this. I mean, some of you that will, I mean, you're, 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 you've committed to this building project, you're giving to the building project that, that will serve this youth and, and children of our, our community for generations to come. And some of you, you don't have children and grandchildren that are going to get to participate in that, okay? You don't, you don't have family that's going to benefit from that. But you have a vision that this church is the beacon of light in the community in the city on the hill, and you hope it will be for generations to come until Jesus comes. And I think of grandparents who have stepped in and made a difference, huge difference, sometimes raising your grandchildren in the love of Christ at a time when you, sh- you could have been serving yourself, you know? You could have had a lot of freedom because you were done with your kids, but now you're raising grandkids, or you have. And I think of many of you who are serving as volunteers in communities, in the school system, volunteers, hospitals, volunteers, nursing homes, assisted care facilities, food banks, and you're making a difference for others, and you're making a difference for the kingdom of God. And I think of how many of you are lovingly caring for your spouses, or more so, we see a lot of this, you're caring for your aging parents who are struggling with severe health problems, Alzheimer's, or some other difficult situation. And I think of still others who have lost loved ones. And now, perhaps after decades of living life together, 50, 60, 70 years, you're going it alone, grinding it out one day at a time, living the faith, living the hope that one day you'll see them again. And so every morning you get up in this world, and although your heart is already in the next one, you're here. You're here this morning. You came to church, and you're not alone because you brought Jesus with you. And because you did, you greeted others with a genuine smile on your face. Yeah, for you, the race is long, but you're sticking with it. Even though there are days when you don't understand what's going on or it's a season of trouble and trial, you're sticking with it, and you have no regrets. Yes, the race is long, but you're running with your eyes on the prize. I don't think Solomon could have said he had no regrets because I think he had many, but here it is. What it, what it seems he's doing here is that because of what he's learned, he wants to kind of tip us off and save us the trouble and the hardship if we'll just listen. Jesus said something likewise in Matthew seven thirteen and 14, how you enjoy life. He says, enter through the narrow gate, For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many will enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life, and only a few will find it. The final lesson that Solomon shares is this. Your hour will come, you be ready for it. Your hour will come, you be ready for it. We all have to do it, you know. There's no escape for anyone, right? We're aware, right? Because the statistics, The statistics speak the truth to us. It says, statistics will tell you that one out of every one people eventually die, (laughs) right? And you can quote me on that. Uh, Anyway, there are a couple guys in the Bible, by the way, that didn't die, right? Enoch and Elijah. So I'm just going to say it because someone's going to come up and go, you know, there was two guys. Yeah, I know. But other than them, you know, there's no escape, right? You know, I once heard about a guy who went to the doctor to get the results of an annual physical, and the doctor met with him and said, I'm sorry, Bill, I've got some bad news for you. The tests show you have a terminal disease, and you only have about six months to live. Bill let the news sink in a little, and then he asked, Is there anything I can do, Doc? Any experimental drugs? Any special treatment? There has to be something that I can try. And the doctor thought for a moment and said, Well, there is this one thing. You can move to the country, buy a pig farm, and raise pigs. Then you can find a widow who has six kids under the age of seven, marry her, and bring them all to live with you on the pig farm. And the Bill looked a little puzzled and said, Doc, will that actually help me live longer? And the doctor said, No, but it'll be the longest six months of your life. (laughs) There's no escape. Okay, uh, death is inevitable. Ecclesiastes nine twelve says, Moreover, no man knows when his hour will come. As fish are caught in a cruel net or birds are taken in a snare, so men are trapped by evil times that fall unexpectedly upon them. Solomon's point, 
The season of life is unpredictable, okay? As the duration of your life, no person knows when his or her hour is going to come, but it's going to come. Preacher Tony Evans once said, we have it backwards. We measure things by our birth date when really we should measure them by our death date. And the only problem is, is we don't know when that is. We don't know how many years or months or days we have. So Solomon's correct. No man knows when his hour will come. And listen, friend, young or old, and which, by the way, by my calculations, old is now 75. It's always 10 years older than what you are, right? And uh, it's always 10 years. But here's the truth. If you are young or if you are old, your hour will come. And so you need to be ready. Because the kingdom of heaven is a prepared place for prepared people. Hebrews 9.27 says like this. It says, is it appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment? I heard old preacher once say, Satan won't tell you there's no hell, and he won't tell you that there's no heaven, but he will tell you there's no hurry. Don't you believe him? Because you and I, my friends, have no idea when we'll be called home. And all God's people said, let's pray. Father, we come this morning, and uh, Lord, uh, we, we once again this week listen to the words of Solomon, who you granted great wisdom. And Lord, uh, and though we know he went down a path where he just tried everything, at the end he's coming to his senses and he's trying to share with us what he's learned. Lord, I pray that we would have ears to hear that there's no true happiness under the sun. It's only found in God. And that we should enjoy life because our time is short. But while we're here, we should make the most of it. We should run the race all the way to the end and then receive the reward you have for us. Lord, I pray it would be so. I pray it would be so that we live faithful, that those that follow us would understand that it leads to great joy. It leads to faithfulness, that we would teach by the lessons that we live. We would teach by the lessons we live. I pray it would be so. I pray it for this body, Lord, that we would be the light on a hill, uh, the beacon of light shining in this community and draw others to you by the way that we follow our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray for his kingdom. Amen. I'm going to sing a song.